Hi, and welcome to Crash Course Catholicism, a podcast about Catholic teaching and why it makes sense. I'm your host, Caitlin West. Hello, and welcome to this episode on Faith, Works, and Salvation. So from next episode onwards, we're going to get stuck into the kind of meat of the Ten Commandments. But before we do that, we're going to end our introduction to Catholic morality in this episode by looking at one final topic. And this is a big one. This is the topic of faith works, grace, and justification. So in other words, today we're going to ask the question, how are we saved? Are we saved by faith alone? Are we saved through our good works or are both involved in our salvation? Now, this is a big and very important question for Christians. Peter Kraft says that it was the single most important issue of the Protestant Reformation, the single most tragic division in the history of the church. So this question is really at the heart of the schism between Protestants and Catholics. And this is why it's super important that we understand it. And in particular, that we understand what the Catholic Church actually teaches. Because I've often found in my conversations with Protestant friends that a lot of the conflict between us about justification actually arises out of a misunderstanding of what we both believe. Okay, now I just want to say from the outset that throughout this episode, we'll be looking a little bit at Protestant theology on justification, and I'm very aware that it's impossible to capture the full complexity and nuance of the different beliefs of different denominations within Protestantism. So for the purposes of this episode, I've mainly relied on the theology of the first Protestant reformers, so people like Luther and Calvin, because these are the guys who kind of set the foundations for Protestant theology. Okay, now you might have encountered before a kind of oversimplified summary of the differences between Catholic teaching and Protestant teaching on justification. So you might have heard something like this. Catholics believe that we can earn our salvation if we do enough good things. So Catholics believe that we're saved by our good works. In contrast, Protestants believe that we can't earn our salvation, but that we are saved purely by the grace of God through faith alone, and this makes good works kind of unnecessary. Now, this is a wildly inaccurate summary of Catholics and Protestants. Catholics don't believe that we can earn our salvation through good works. Also, Protestants don't believe that good works are completely unnecessary. That idea does a total injustice to Protestant theology. In fact, when we look at it closely, we can see that Catholics and Protestants actually share many of the same beliefs in this area, although we do differ in key ways. So, the Catholic Church, in points 1996 to 1998 of the Catechism, says, Our justification comes from the grace of God. It depends entirely on God's gratuitous initiative, for he alone can reveal and give himself. It surpasses the power of human intellect and will. And this is kind of an echo of Ephesians chapter 2. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not the result of works, so that no one may boast. So Catholics agree with Protestants on this. We both believe that it is only through the grace of God that we can be brought into a relationship with him. Without his grace, we're totally powerless. As Jesus says in John 15, 5, apart from me, you can do nothing. And we've talked about this before, right? That I can no more put the spark of divine life into my soul than I can put the spark of human life into my body. And even if you were to like attach strings to my arms and legs and sort of make me move around, that wouldn't bring my body to life. In the same way, if I were to sort of doggedly do the right thing and just follow the moral law, I mean, that's good objectively, but if that's all I'm doing, that's not going to bring my soul to life. 
You know how some like light switches have a dimmer that you can turn up or down to make the lights brighter or darker? Well, imagine if you were turning the dimmer all the way up, but the light switch wasn't actually on. There was no electricity flowing through the wires. Nothing would happen. So it's the same with us, right? My good works are spiritually useless if I don't have that current of the divine life already flowing through me. And I receive that current, what we call sanctifying grace, through the free, gratuitous gift of God through the sacrament of baptism. And all I need to do or all I can do is just to accept and be open to that grace. Now, if you want a more detailed recap on any of this, I recommend revisiting the episode that we did on baptism. I think that's episode 18. Okay, so Catholics and Protestants agree that our salvation comes from the saving grace obtained by Christ, which we receive through our faith in God. And then the question that follows from that is, okay, well, what is the role of good works in all of this? And this is where Catholics and non-Catholic Christians start to deviate. Now, our differences in opinion here mainly come down to our understanding of what human nature is like before it's been justified. Okay, what do I mean by that? Okay, let's unpack it. So the Protestant reformers believed that when original sin entered the world, human nature became completely corrupted. So in our natural fallen state, we are enslaved, totally enslaved to sin, to the point where we are incapable of wholeheartedly, purely choosing the good. So Luther talks about how we are naturally the enemy of the law. We don't ever want to do the right thing. And even if we do do the right thing, ultimately we're doing it out of selfishness or pride or because, you know, there's something we want or something. So basically sin is present in everything I do. It infects all of my moral choices. Now, if this is true and I'm enslaved to sin in this way, what that means is that I'm not ultimately free to choose the good. I'm incapable, right? Because I will ultimately always choose sin. And what that means is that I then have to rely wholly on God to choose me rather than me choosing God. So Luther compared it to a horse that is totally reliant on whomever is riding it. So if the devil is riding the horse, then it will go in the wrong direction. But if God is riding the horse, then it will go in the right direction. And this is what justification was to Luther and Calvin. God coming into our lives, choosing us, justifying us and pointing us in the right direction. Now, once God gets on the horse, the horse will inevitably go in the right direction because God, who is riding the horse, is goodness itself. So he's not going to lead the horse astray. And this is where good works come into play. For a Protestant, once someone has been justified and they're in well, what we would call the state of grace, but I don't think Protestants call it the state of grace. Once we've been justified, good works will inevitably, must inevitably follow. They are necessary, not in the sense that like you have to do good works, but in the sense that they are an inevitable consequence of the fact that I've been justified. So if someone is not doing any good works, then that's a sign that they are not justified, that God's not riding the horse. Now, all of this makes total sense if you are coming from that understanding that our fallen nature is one of what we call total depravity. So that's what we described earlier, where I'm totally enslaved to sin. And this is where the Protestant reformers were coming from. However, Catholic theology differs on this crucial point of enslavement to sin. Catholics don't believe in the idea of total depravity. So if we go all the way back to point 405 of the catechism, it says that human nature has not been totally corrupted. It is simply wounded. So in other words, because of original sin, we are all inclined towards evil, but we're not 
totally enslaved by it to the point where we don't have any moral freedom and we will always and inevitably desire what is evil. So point 2002 of the Catechism says that God has placed in man a longing for truth and goodness that only he can satisfy. So that longing is embedded in us, whether or not we're in the state of grace. So unlike what the reformers argued, Catholics believe that often, I mean, not always, but often we actually do genuinely desire the moral good. It's just that we almost have a kind of spiritual ADD, which is constantly getting distracted by the shiny things along the way. I remember a priest once describing it like a car with bad wheel alignment. You know, it's pointed in the right direction, but as soon as you take your hands off the wheel, it sort of starts to drift off course. And Father Mike Schmitz talks about this as well, that without the grace of God, we will kind of drift into sin. So this constant pull towards selfishness and comfort and pride, that's what we call concupiscence. And that is totally present and constantly sort of tugging us away from the moral good. But crucially, in Catholic theology, it doesn't have total dominion over us. So rather than being completely deprived of my moral freedom, I'm actually in this constant state of like internal battle, right? Where on the one hand, I'm like, okay, I really want to do the right thing. And on the other hand, I'm like, ice cream. (laughs) So what this means is that ultimately we have a choice. We are morally free. So point 2002 of the catechism says that the soul only enters freely into the communion of love. And this is the crucial difference between Catholic and Protestant theology around justification is this idea of moral freedom. So if we are free, then justification isn't so much like God leaping onto a passive horse and riding it to heaven. It actually involves our free acceptance of God's grace. Now, the initiative still comes from God. The whole process relies entirely on God's initiative. But it's kind of like he comes towards us with his hand outstretched and waits for us to let him take the reins. And then even... Once we have accepted God's grace and he's the one riding the horse, so we're in the state of sanctifying grace, even then we remain free and God continues to respect our freedom. So that means that, you know, he's there in the saddle, guiding us in the right direction, whispering in our ear, sort of generally making it a heck of a lot easier to go in the right direction. But at any point, I remain free to resist the guidance of the Holy Spirit, to pull against the reins and start sort of wandering off in the wrong direction. I can even buck him off the horse entirely if I want to. Right. So we have to make the choice deliberately and consistently to allow God to remain in the saddle and to lead us in the right direction. So our freedom is constantly involved in that process of of the journey to heaven. So this is where the idea of works becomes important in Catholic theology. It's not that we are earning our salvation by doing good works. Rather, it's that because I'm free, even once I'm in the state of grace, I have to continue to freely cooperate with the grace of God through my works to say yes to the promptings of the Holy Spirit in my heart and in my actions. So works unnecessary, not as a source and cause of our salvation, and also not as a kind of inevitable passive consequence of our salvation, but as part of our free collaboration with God's saving power over our lifetime. So St. Augustine writes, we work, but we are only collaborating with God who works, for his mercy has gone before us. So when we cooperate with God's grace through our works, we become not just saved, but also sanctified. We become not just someone who is going to eventually go to heaven, but we also become someone who is becoming more and more like Christ himself. And this is where the kind of rider on a horse metaphor starts to break down, because from a Catholic perspective, our goal isn't just to let God sort of ride the horse to heaven. Our goal 
is that by the time we get to heaven, we are no longer a horse at all. So Romans chapter 8 says that we are called to be conformed to the image of his son in order that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. In other words, we are called not just to get to heaven, but also along the way to become more and more like Christ until we become another Christ, to be so fully conformed to him and to his will that we reflect him back to himself. It's like the poet Jared Manley Hopkins says, Christ plays in a thousand places to the Father through the features of men's faces. I love that poem. Oh my gosh. Okay, so from a Protestant perspective – It's impossible for me to become just like Christ because my fallen human nature is inherently, ultimately closed to God's grace. It's like a stone in a river. The water can't flow into the stone, but it can flow over and around the stone. So instead of my fallen nature being transformed and purified and perfected from within, it's more like Christ's goodness and power and and righteousness flows over me and covers me. However, that perfection remains separate from me. It's kind of like when Tony Stark steps into the Iron Man suit and becomes Iron Man. When he does that, he doesn't gain any extra personal power. He just puts on the power of the suit. So I was talking to my Protestant friend about this, and he explained it like this. He said, when I get to heaven... And my wedding garment is covered in the inevitable stains of sin because I'm a sinner. Christ will say to me, throw away that garment because I took on those sins in my crucifixion and death. And instead, put on my perfectly clean, spotless garment, which I earned for you through my death and resurrection. And this is that the Protestant concept of how grace works, right? That God's grace is like a cloak that covers my sinful nature and makes me acceptable to God, but it doesn't transform my nature from within. And again, all of this makes total sense if you're coming from that place of like total enslavement to sin. We cannot become righteous. We can only put on the righteousness of Christ. But again, here we come back to the Catholic concept of freedom, because even though I am a sinner, obviously, I I mean, I'm going to struggle with sin for the rest of my life. I am not totally closed to the moral good. I am able to choose the good. And that means that the grace of God can flow not just over me and around me, but into and through me. It can purify me from within. So the Catechism in points 1996 and 1997 says that grace is, first of all, the free and undeserved help that God gives us. And secondly, it is a participation in the life of God. So in other words, God's grace doesn't just help me from the outside, from without. It also flows into me and helps me from within. And then insofar as I am open and receptive to the divine life of Christ, I will be purified and I will become more and more like Christ from the inside out. So this is the Catholic concept of grace and how grace works. So the compendium of the catechism, point 424, lists the different types of grace. So in other words, the different ways that God can help us in our lives. Now, the first is obviously sanctifying grace. And we've talked about that before. That's that habitual connectedness to God. And then we have actual graces. So actual graces aren't like habitual grace. Habitual grace is like the flow, the electric current flowing through me. Actual graces are gifts for specific circumstances. So for instance, when God gives you the grace to overcome a particular fear or to pass an exam or to feel sorry for your sins. So these are specific graces for specific circumstances. And then thirdly, we have sacramental graces. So these are the particular gifts that are attached to each of the seven sacraments. There are also special graces or charisms. So these are like the special gifts and talents that the Holy Spirit gives individuals. So St. Paul talks about these in 1 Corinthians 12. He talks about wisdom, knowledge, faith, healing, the working of powerful deeds, prophecy, discernment, etc. 
And then finally, we have the graces of state, which accompany the exercise of ecclesial ministries and the responsibilities of life. So basically what that means is that God gives each person the grace to live out their own individual vocation, right? To to follow their unique path to heaven. So for some people, that might be through marriage or through the priesthood or through the religious life, etc. And actually, this can be a really important thing to remember. Sometimes when we're thinking about, you know, what's God calling me to? What's my vocation? We can get caught up in thinking, you know, I don't have the grace to do this, right? I, I would be a terrible mother or I would be a terrible nun or consecrated person or whatever. And this is something that Father Jacques Philippe talks about, that like God doesn't give us the grace to do things that we're not doing yet. <laughs> so God will give us the grace of a particular, if he's calling us to a particular state in life, then when we step into that state, he will give us the grace to do it. That's, it's literally a type of grace that has its own category in the catechism. <laughs> so we don't have to worry about that. Now, as Catholics, we sometimes talk about, or we often talk about meriting God's grace. Now, this can sound a little bit sort of icky to our Protestant friends, because it can sound like a kind of transaction where, you know, I do these good things and now God owes me his grace. And that sounds a little bit like, you know, salvation through works, but that's not what we mean at all. Point 2010 of the catechism says, first of all, no one can merit the initial grace of justification, but Once we've been justified, then moved by the Holy Spirit, we can merit for ourselves and for others the graces needed for our sanctification. So to understand this idea, we can return to an image that we used right at the start of the episode of a light switch with a dimmer attached to it. Once the switch is on in my spiritual life and the the current, the grace is flowing through me, I can become more open to God's grace. I can allow more of his grace to flow through me if I say yes to God and the promptings of the Holy Spirit. The more open I am, the more grace I will receive or merit and the brighter my sort of light will be. On the other hand, if I say no to God or I ignore the promptings of the Holy Spirit, even just in little ways, I can start to close myself off to that outpouring of God's grace. And it's like dimming the light, even if it doesn't go out entirely. And this is why the church teaches us that we have to try to avoid venial sin and even faults and lukewarmness, because it's a lot easier to bump a light off entirely if it's already dimmed all the way down than if it's like turned up the whole way. Now, when we take all of this into account, when we consider the fact that my moral choices affect my salvation, even if it doesn't earn my salvation, it affects my salvation, and I can turn up or dim or even put out the light of Christ through my actions, then a couple of things become clear. First of all, the moral law Those rules of what is right and wrong that are summarized in the Ten Commandments, they become really important because it's not just that, you know, we should do the right thing because we love God and we love others and it will make us happy. And it's not just that good deeds will naturally flow from our justification. I mean, all of that is true and good, but... More than that, our moral actions affect our salvation and our sanctification, and that is huge. So it's really important that we know what is right and wrong and that we try to do it. If we use the language of some of our earlier episodes, we try to avoid committing mortal sins. The second thing that's important is the role of the church. Now, we've talked at some length about the Catholic Church in episodes 14 and 15, but just one point to make here is that the church isn't just, you know, a place where we go to pray to God or to experience community, even though those things are really great. More than that, though, the church, I mean, the catechism reminds us in point 2030 that the church acts as a guide and helps us to understand and to apply the moral law in different situations. As well as that, she also provides us with the grace of the sacraments, and that really helps us to become sanctified and to remain in a state of grace. Okay, now before we wrap up, we're just going to do a brief introduction to the moral law and the Ten Commandments before we begin with that first commandment in our next episode. So 
The Catechism talks about three kind of dimensions of the moral law. First of all, the natural law. Secondly, the old law. And then thirdly, the new law. The natural law, the old law, the new law. Now, we've talked before about the natural law. Pope St. Leo XIII writes that the natural law is written and engraved in the soul of each and every man. So it's that truth that's embedded in our conscience that tells us what is right and wrong. But we've also said before that our conscience is not always the most reliable interpreter of the truth. Sometimes we get things wrong. And this is where the Ten Commandments come in, otherwise known as the old law. Point 1961 of the Catechism says that the truths naturally accessible to reason are stated and authenticated in the old law. So in other words, the Ten Commandments or the Decalogue summarize the natural law and kind of make it official. And that's really helpful in situations where we're not entirely sure whether our conscience is interpreting something correctly or not. It's like a kind of scaffolding that humanity has been able to fall back on. Now, Point 1963 of the Catechism says that the old law is holy, spiritual, and good, yet still imperfect. Like a tutor, it shows what must be done, but does not of itself give the strength, the grace of the Spirit to fulfill it. Okay, so what does that mean? What that means is that the Ten Commandments are like just straight up rules without the grace and the incentive that makes them easy to follow. So we can think of it like this, you know, with little kids, when they haven't reached the age of reason yet, so you can't appeal to their sense of objective right and wrong. They also haven't honed their skills of self-control and virtue yet. And they're also just tiny little adorable tyrannical egotists who are the center of their own universe. Okay. So you can't convince them to do the right thing based on like objective morality. Really, all you can do is rely on punishment and reward. You have to say to them, okay, these are the rules. Do this. Don't do that. If you obey the rules, you will get something nice. And if you disobey them, you will go to your room. And that's basically how you function until they get older and they start to develop that capacity to understand right and wrong and to seek the good for its own sake. Well, when we look at the Old Testament, This is like the point in salvation history where human beings were like little kids in the sense that they didn't have sanctifying grace. They didn't have the example of Christ. And God just had to say to them, "Okay, do this. Don't do that. And that's why the Ten Commandments read quite legalistically, right? Thou shalt not. Now, there's nothing wrong with this per se. There's nothing wrong with just straight up rules if someone isn't capable of more than that. But in the New Testament, we see Jesus, God made incarnate. And not only was Jesus a living, fully human example of perfection, through his death and resurrection, we were able to receive the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And this gave us the kind of jet fuel, the incentive to do the right thing, not just out of fear and punishment or a kind of legalism, but out of love of others and of God, out of charity. So point 1966 of the Catechism says that the new law is the grace of the Holy Spirit. It works through charity. It teaches us what must be done and makes use of the sacraments to give us the grace to do it. So if the old law is summarized in the Ten Commandments, then the new law is summarized in the Sermon on the Mount. The Sermon on the Mount is like the flip side of a coin. It's like the the Ten Commandments but with the jet fuel of love under them. So the new law fulfills, refines, and perfects the old law. It's like the Ten Commandments brought to life. So when we think of these three dimensions of the moral law, we can think of it like building a house. The natural law is like the scaffolding and the foundations of the house. And then the old law is like adding the walls and the rooms and the roof to the house, giving it a clearer, more distinctive, more solid shape. And then the new law, the Holy Spirit, It's like someone coming along and painting and decorating the house and filling it with furniture and then putting people in it. Okay, so now the house has been perfected and completed and it's full of life and love. So 
All of these three elements of morality are captured in a single moment in the New Testament that actually appears in the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke. So in this scene of the Gospel, a young man comes to Jesus and asks him, what must I do to enter the kingdom of heaven? And Jesus, first of all, responds by affirming the natural law and the Ten Commandments. He says, you know the commandments, you shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness, you shall not defraud, honor your father and mother. And then the young man responds, teacher, I have kept all these since my youth. And then it says, Jesus, looking at him, loved him and said, you lack one thing, go Sell what you own and give the money to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. Ugh, honestly, that line, Jesus looked at him and loved him, literally like makes me want to cry every time I read it. It's like one of my favorite lines in the whole New Testament. Ugh. Okay, now the catechism tells us that in that moment with this young man, man more broadly is invited to rediscover the law in the person of his master, who is its perfect fulfillment. So in other words, here Jesus is reminding us that the moral law, doing good works, is a means and not an end. The end is a loving personal relationship with God himself. God looks at each and every one of us and loves us and then invites us to follow him, not just to follow the rules, to follow him. So our pursuit of the Ten Commandments always has to be driven by this relationship, right? The Catechism says that the Decalogue must be interpreted in the light of the commandment of love. So this is one thing you might notice as we go through the Ten Commandments, is that the Catechism doesn't just explain what each one means, it also reflects on and expands on those commandments in the light of the Gospel. Okay, so that is it for our episode for today. Next episode, we're going to start talking about the Ten Commandments. We're going to start with the first one, obviously. <laughs> okay, great. Um, I can't wait. Have a great fortnight and I will talk to you later. Bye.